All right, so today we're gonna to talk about how to write a purchase and sale agreement in app files. So some helpful tools just to make reference of. We have an app files guide that is on the cloud. Drew's created it, it's great. Um, I'll send you guys a link to that when we're done today. He also has a lot of YouTube tutorials where he goes through how to do certain things in app files. Then, like I said, I've done that how to write a purchase and sale agreement guide. That is what we're going to kind of follow today in this PowerPoint. And we are going to go step by step. And then Drew does an app files class. Um, he usually does it once a quarter which, with basics. So if we find a need to do more of those, we can add those on also. And I can step in and help too. So just really and quick things to go through when you have questions. And then another thing I should add to this is App Files Help Desk is really, really good. They're very responsive. They are really nice. <laughs> sometimes help desks are not the nicest people, I don't think sometimes. So they are so helpful and um, we'll get back to you really quickly. I actually had a question this morning I emailed them about and they already got back to me. So. Just keep that on your radar. If you have something that's after hours, you can't get a hold of your broker, and it's more of a technical question, not a negotiating type um, question that your broker would need to answer. All right, so how I'm gonna break this down is before you take your client to see property, what you need to do, after you found the property, and then writing the contract. So starting off, is before you take your client to see property. You can get started from the very beginning and set yourself up for success in app files by creating a new app file for your client. So you get a new client, you sign the buyer, you're getting ready to sign the buyer brokerage engagement agreement. Go ahead and create that app file for them. You can fill out any relevant file information in app files. I'm gonna show you how to do that here in a second. Um, you can, go ahead and fill out the selling broker information, that would be you. So if you've not gone into app files and filled out um, under form values, I'm gonna show you how to do that also. Um, the next thing you wanna do is sign the exclusive buyer brokerage engagement agreement in app files, and then obtain your client's pre-approval letter and go ahead and upload that. Because we know in this market right now, things are moving very, very quickly you want to have that pre-approval letter. So when you go see a house and you wanna make an offer on it, you're not having to wait on the lender to send it to you. And also the pre-approval letter is really gonna dictate a lot of the terms of the agreement as far as what they can afford, their rate, the number of days that you're gonna do for the financing or appraisal contingency. So if you can go ahead and have that conversation with the lender, especially in this tight and hot market where you may be wanting to have like very tight contingencies or no contingencies at all. You just wanna make sure that you already have had that discussion with that lender before you go out to see properties. All right, so the scenario that we're gonna work with today is we have buyers, Jack and Jill Smith. We have their email addresses. We have this property that they have found. It's 558 Boulder Crest Drive in Marietta. This is one of Hicks Malonson's properties. It's under contract already, but we're pretending like it is not. Um, we have the MLS number and the buyer is pre-approved with Prosperity and we already have their pre-approval letter. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna go into app files and we are going to start the process of creating their file. All right, and I apologize if this takes me a couple of minutes because I have a new computer and I am used to having a Mac and now I have a PC, so I am learning. There's my button. All right, can everyone see my app files right now? Yes. Awesome. Okay, so I have just started working with Jack and Jill Smith, and I want to go in here and create an app file for them. So the first thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go up here on the top left underneath my picture to create new app file in the green. So I'm going to click on that. And this takes me to this screen. 
So I always start off with just taught titling it their name at the beginning until we get a property under contract. So I would just say Smith and then file type, I'm gonna select buyers, selling agent name, that would be me, branch, that would be your office. So I am in East Cobb, VPN, FMLS, Georgia MLS. We don't know any of that yet because we do not know the, the property that they are going to bank an offer on. We're just starting this from the beginning. So buyer one, is Jack Smith, buyer two is, whoops, can't type, Jill Smith. We don't know the sales price or the closing date. Relo type, this is a personal referral. This is not a, um, a Harry Norman relocation referral. And then transaction type, I know that they are purchasing residential and not commercial. Um, your office may have some other fields here. I know um, some of the other offices add specific things and have a specific way they like this filled out, but this is um, for the generic way. And then I'm just going to click next here. See, I'm not even used to this mouse. Okay. Now I am in new app file. So this is where you can add users to your app file. So if say I'm co-oping with somebody and I want them to have access to this file or my mentor, I would love my mentor to have access to this file. So say Ariel Stark is my mentor and I want to add her to this app file so she can help me. Um, she can go in and review my app file. I don't have to send her the links. I can go here and I can check Ariel and this is adding her to my app file. I can see this down here, selected users. Okay, and then I'm cl clicking create app file and I have my app file created. So the next thing I want to do is I want to go over here and I want to fill out some of my file information on the right hand side, because this is going to help me when I'm filling out my paperwork to import this information so I don't have to retype it every time. So what I'm gonna show you how to do is the buyer information. So I'm gonna click edit. And now that I'm in this field, I can create their buyer information. So I'm going to start off with their last name is Smith. Buyer number one is Jack Smith. And then I have his email address. It's jacksmith at gmail.com. I don't need, I'm not going to fill out all of this information. And then I'm going to go down to, and you can, there's just, I'm not going to put it in here for sake of time. There's no, you know, the more information, the better. Buyer name number two would be Jill Smith. And then I've got her email is jillsmith at gmail.com. All right, so now I am going to close out of this. And I could also fill out other information in here, but as far as the seller information and the listing broker information, I'm going to import that from, F from the FMLS. So I don't need to do that in here. So I'm going to click close. And now I can go back and I can see right here that my buyer information has been saved. Okay. So I'm not going to walk through signing exclusive buyer brokerage engagement agreement today because we're talking about the purchase and sale. But at this point, I would do that. And like I said, I already have their pre-approval letter from Prosperity. So there's a couple of different ways that I can upload the pre-approval letter into my file. I'm going to show you how to do it from upload files this time, and then I can show you how to email it next. So I'm going to click upload files. And then I already have this saved on my computer. I've already uploaded, I've Prosperity emailed it to me. I saved it to my computer. So now I'm gonna upload it to my app file. So I'm gonna click browse. If I can figure out how to work my mouse, sorry y'all. All right, so I'm gonna find where I saved it. And you guys probably can't even see this part because of how, but I'm scrolling through my computer, finding where I saved their 
pre-approval letter. Okay, so I have it in here and now I'm gonna click start upload and files uploaded. So right here, I can see that my pre-approval letter has been uploaded on the left-hand side and I can click on it and I can see it right here. So I just did a generic one. All right, does everyone follow what we've done so far? Any questions? The only other thing that I would suggest you doing at this point would obviously be you would sign the buyer brokerage engagement agreement. And then if you've not done form values before, that is something I would suggest you do. That would be your homework when we get off of this class. So how you can do that is go to My App Files Home. And this is going to save you so much time because these are going to be saved in your form every time. So if you go here to form values by my picture and you go to the form that you want to fill out. So let's go to the um, buyer brokerage engagement agreement right here, the F110. So anything that I fill out under form values is going to be saved. So every time that I pull up a buyer brokerage en engagement agreement, it's going to be saved in here. So what I would suggest would be the most important to do would be doing your information. So let me get to that page. On the, that would be on the signature page. So see down here under the broker's affiliated licensee contact information, how I've already filled in all of my information down here. This will be a huge time saver when you're writing contracts that this is already in here. You don't have to look up your office code, your, the firm license number, the fax number, because who can remember that? So I would definitely go ahead and fill this out for all of the forms that you're going to use a lot. The buyer brokerage engagement agreement, the listing agreement, and the purchase and sale agreement it would be very important to go ahead and fill this out on. Huge time saver. All right, so let's go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so our property that we're going to see is Boulder Crest. They have decided that they like it and we are going to make an offer on it. So I've got my MLS number is 686. Four five three nine. So we found the property. Next thing that you're going to do is you're going to research the comparable properties on the MLS. This is very important to do even right now when you're probably going to have to offer at least asking price. But you're going to want to know exactly how much you should go over, what things are selling for in the area. That way you'll know what it will comp out at. And you just want to be the proactive advisor to show your buyer that you know what's going on in the area. Another important thing to do at this point is you're going to discuss with the listing agent what is important to the seller and ask if there is an offer deadline. Even in a, a different market where we are not um, in multiple offers and on these tight time frames, I think it's always important to talk with the listing agent, let them know that an offer is coming and ask them what's important to the seller. Because I would say nine times out of 10, or probably 9.5 times out of 10, it's going to be the price, but they may have a certain closing date they want, or they need temporary occupancy, or they would like to close at a specific closing attorney because they are already under contract on another purchase and they want to do a back-to-back -back closing. So always be the professional and have that discussion with the listing agent. It goes a long, long way. And it also shows that you are on top of things and in this market with multiple offers, that's important. Listing agents are going to want to work with a um, co-op agent that is going to be responsive, professional, and knowledgeable. Um, at the end of the day, obviously, it's their client's decision on which offer they're going to go with. But I've heard a lot of stories in this market where there's been two offers. The financials are very, very similar. But... The client says, well, tell me about the agents. So if an agent is able to say that you called, you sold Harry Norman, you sold yourself, you sold your client, because that's all three of those are very important in this market, that goes a long way with a, with a seller. 
So the next thing that you're going to want to do is you want to get the seller's property disclosure and the community association disclosure if those are applicable. If they have those, you can get those from the FMLS if they've been uploaded or the listing agent. You can go ahead and upload those into app files. You'll want the legal description from Campbell and Brannon and upload that into app files. So you can email attorney or attorneys with an S. They will answer to both at campbellandbrannon.com basically 24 hours, they will answer you. So if you need a legal description, go ahead and email them and ask them for it. Best practice when you're writing a contract is to always attach the legal description exhibit. We'll get into that in a little bit. But I mean, if you think your clients are going to write an offer on it, go ahead and ask for the legal description even before you go out to see the property, to set yourself up for success. You already have it, you can get the offer written quickly. And then the next thing is you're going to discuss the key terms of the agreement with your client. And I've created a key terms checklist for you, and that's going to be included in the how to write a purchase and sale agreement guide. Um, I remember when I first started selling that you'd be in a house, you would talk with your clients, and you would think that you talked about all the terms. And then I would get back to my desk to write the offer and realize, oh, we didn't talk about earnest money or we didn't talk about asking for a home warranty. And I'd have to call them back and ask them. And there's nothing wrong with that. But I always would, I would always say, oh, I wish I had a checklist. I wish I'd just gone over this with them. So I think if you have this printed out and you have a form and a process you go through, this shows that you're a professional and that you have a method that you're following. So I always tell my clients now that, or did tell my clients, that I'm reading from a script, I've got a checklist, this is a process I go through. That way they know that you are not going to miss anything. And then I have something in the chat. Okay, someone's asking, um, what exhibit do you use to attach the legal description? And are there ways to copy and paste it? So we will get to that when we get in there. I usually just attach it as an exhibit, as like the PDF that they send me from Campbell and Brandon. So I can show you guys how to do that. All right, so next up is the key terms checklist. So we're pretending like I've already talked to Jack and Jill. We have come up with all of our key terms, but these are all the things that I think that you all should be aware of when you're talking with your clients and that you make sure you cover. So obviously every contract's different, every buyer's different, every seller's different, every house is different. So that's what makes this job so fun is because every day you're learning something, but these are the main items that would be important to discuss with your client. So number one will be the purchase price. We are going to offer 775, that's the list price. Closing costs paid by seller, that is, we're gonna ask for $5,000. Closing date and possession date, we are going to offer a June 30th for both. Closing attorney, Campbell and Brannon. Earnest money holder is going to be Harry Norman, which is what we always prefer. Earnest money amount, we're going to do $10,000 for this one. Earnest money um, for the newer agents, if you're not aware, it's typically one to 2%. There's not a set number. I know in some states, it's pretty set as far as what you offer. In Georgia, it's up to your discretion, but that shows your client's um, interest, their good faith in the property um, right off the bat. Um, right now we're seeing higher amounts of earnest money. However, and you're gonna hear this in your sales meeting tomorrow, just make sure that your client knows no matter what amount of earnest money it is, that that's at risk if they default. So the higher amount of earnest money, the higher amount of risk. And then due diligence period, we're going to offer seven days for this contract. Again, if you're a newer agent, typically what we see for due diligence is seven to 14, seven to 10 days. In this tight market, I would say the shorter, the better. However, make sure you talk with your inspector before you offer this, even go ahead and schedule it if you're able to. Um, I know some inspectors, I know Home Probe for one, will go ahead and let you schedule an inspection prior to being under contract. So. If you're offering and you can go ahead and tell that listing agent, I have the inspection scheduled for Monday. We are going to get due diligence over even quicker than five days, what we're offering. That's going to set you apart. So just think of these things when you're putting in your offer. 
special stipulations. We are going to ask the seller to provide a home warranty and then also a termite letter inspection because they've not had a bond on it for this scenario. We're pretending that. Financing terms, I've already discussed with Prosperity. I know that Jack and Jill are pre-approved. They have a conventional loan, 30-year term, and they are pre-approved for a 2.75% interest rate. And then for the financing appraisal contingency periods, we're going to do 18 days on, on both. All right, let me check the chat really quick. Okay, how enter exhibit number or letter on uploaded files. We're gonna go over that when we get into app files. And then SE asks, if you put zero on seller's cost at closing on an offer, is it still understood that the seller will cover buyer and seller commission? Yes, it is. So these closing costs that we're putting in this contract, these are gonna be the ones that are aside from the commissions. So the commissions are an agreement that the seller and the listing broker, that's their agreement. That's when they sign that listing agreement. This is completely separate. These are gonna be closing costs that the seller is going to contribute to the buyer's closing costs. So that would be, things that would go for their um, loan fees, their appraisal, you know, anything that they are gonna have to bring to the closing table that's separate from their down payment. And then Estelle asked why the 18 days for financing and appraisal. So financing and appraisal contingencies, you usually see anywhere from 18 to 24 days in a normal market. Um, for this scenario, I'm just, using 18 days because that's what the prosperity lender told me that they could do. That would be the quickest. Um, we're this scenario, I'm not really looking at it like we're in this hot market because that's a whole nother class on how to negotiate and write a good offer in this um, competitive market we have right now. But we're gonna do 18 days just for this example. All right, so we're gonna go into app files now and we're gonna, upload the seller's property disclosure and the legal description that I got from Campbell and Brannon. Going back into app files, and I'm gonna go into the one we just created. So I am in this app file where I already have the pre-approval letter and I would already have my exclusive buyer brokerage engagement agreement. So I'm going to add those two forms that I got. Whoops, not add the forms, I'm sorry. I'm gonna upload. I'm gonna upload my files. Same way as I did before, I'm just gonna browse. And I have my seller's property disclosure. And then I also have my legal description from Campbell and Brannon. So you can upload two at a time and I'm just gonna start upload. Another thing that I would suggest you upload into your app file, and some offices I believe require agents to upload this, would be the FMLS listing. And the reason why they suggest you doing this is because that shows the commission on it, that that listing broker is promising to pay you on the listing. So there's been scenarios that I've heard of where once you go to fill out the instructions to closing attorney, that the agent has then changed what they're willing to offer. So it just protects you if you go ahead and you print out that agent full in FMLS to a PDF and upload it. So I've already done that and I'm gonna upload that now as well. Whoops, I keep clicking on the wrong thing. So I'm gonna go back to upload files and I'm gonna go to browse. And then I have that FMLS listing here. And I'll click on it so you can see what I'm talking about. This would be this agent full, that's full as an F-U-L-L. -L. I always feel like my Southern accent makes it sound like I'm saying something different. So if you scroll down, here under listing agent, owner, et cetera. This shows that buyer agency compensation of 3%. That's just always good to go ahead and have this saved in here. 
All right, let me go to the chat. What's the time limit and the offer date? Okay, we're gonna go over that as well when we get into filling all of this out. So we're just doing the legwork to set us up for success right now. And another thing I wanted to show you in here is you see where I'm circling with my mouse right here in the middle of the screen where it says file access. Right here, there it says file mailbox and there is an email address, okay? This email address is specific to this app file for Jack and Jill Smith, okay? So say Prosperity had emailed me the pre-approval letter and I did not wanna save it to my computer. I can just forward it to this app file, okay? So if I click copy this email address and I've got that check mark, it's saved. If I go into my email and I want to forward something to this app file, I just have to forward it to this email address. Okay, I can also do that with something that's saved on my computer as well, and it'll forward it just like I had uploaded it. So that is a really, really easy trick, and I love that part about app files. It makes it so much easier where you don't have to save things to your computer. All right, so back to PowerPoint. So we found the property, we have discussed our key terms, we know what we're going to offer, and now it is time to write the offer. So we're gonna go through these steps and app files together, but I just wanna go through the checklist right now before we go back. So when you're in the app file, we're gonna to go to add forms and we're going to add all the forms that we need as far as the exhibits, et cetera. We're going to import the buyer information from the app file. We're also going to import the listing information from the FMLS. And now it's time to fill in the blanks. So we're gonna go ahead and do that. And then we are going to answer that question that SE asked earlier about the exhibits that were uploaded into app files from an outside source will still need to be edited to add letters, offer dates, and signatures, and then signatures and initials are required on all exhibits. So very important to remember that. You're going to review for any blanks, errors, typos, etc. Sign and initial the purchase and sale, and then you're going to send it to your buyers to sign. So we're going to go into app files and do this now. I have a question. Who would you normally forward or include a copy of the purchase and sale to? So you would want everyone that's on the loan to sign the purchase and sale. So Jack, where Jack and Jill are both on this loan, so they're both going to sign this one. And then after you go binding, you'll wanna send it to the closing attorney and the lender, as well as notify your office. Um, that's something that we're gonna go over in that class I'm gonna do in June, is who you'll forward it to after you go binding. All right, so back to our app file. We are ready to write our contract. Yay, so we know that we're going to need what exhibits and forms. We know that we are going to have our purchase and sale agreement. They're having a conventional loan. So we're gonna need the conventional loan exhibit. There's a seller's property disclosure that we've already uploaded and we're gonna have the legal description. They are not asking for temporary occupancy. So we don't need that exhibit. The house was not built prior to 1978. So we don't need lead-based paint. And Jack and Jill do not have a house to sell. So we do not need a contingency to sell their home. So this is a pretty basic contract to start out with, but I think it's important because we're just going to talk about a lot of the processes and app files. So I don't want to get bombarded with the actual um, terms itself. So if you have any questions, again, please feel free to take yourself off mute or type in the chat. But so what we're going to do first is we're going to go to add forms on the left. Okay, so this brings you up to the add form box. So I'm gonna first start off with the purchase and sale. So there, like with anything, there's a lot of different ways to go about searching these. You could search from show all forms. You can scroll through here. The way that I like to do is I like to type in a keyword to pull it up. So I'm gonna type in purchase and sale agreement and here it is right here. So I'm gonna click that. 
Next up, I need my conventional loan contingency agreement. So I'm going to click that. And then those are the only two that I'm going to pull from the GAR forms. Okay, the other ones I already have uploaded into my app file. So I'm going to show you how to merge all those in a minute. So I want to merge these as one file. So I'm clicking add as a single merged form because I want these together as one form. If you wanted to do them as separate, you can click here, but it's going to make your life a lot easier if you merge them together. You can choose which section you want it in. Right now, I'm just going to keep it in general paperwork. And I'm going to click add selected forms. If I wanted to change the order to these, all I have to do is drag them and it changes the order. But I want the purchase and sale agreement on top. So I'm gonna click add selected forms and here it is. All right, so right now I'm gonna close out of this because the next thing that I want to do is I want to merge my seller's property disclosure and also the legal description with my purchase and sale. So I can go up here underneath where it says paperwork tools. If I click merge paperwork, this is a similar screen of what we were just in. So if I click purchase and sale agreement, because I want that to be on the top, and then everyone has a different order they like to put their purchase and sale in. I like to do it by, the, I do the conventional loan exhibit, and then I like to do the disclosures. So I'm gonna click on my seller's property disclosure. And then lastly, I put the legal description. This is just the way I like to do it. Everyone likes to do it differently. So this is the order I want mine to be in. And I'm going to click merge selected items. Right, let me check this chat. Okay, so that was just someone's hopping off. They sent me a private chat. No problem, we're recording this. So if you need to hop off, no problem. This is not a CE class. So you're not, you know, we're not watching your camera right now. All right. So we have all of our forms in here. As you can see, we've got 23 pages. So everything is on this one document. So if I want to change the name of this document, at the very top, I can click this little edit pencil and I can click it, change it here. So I always like to change it to the address 558 Boulder Crest purchase and sale agreement, and then I don't like all this other stuff. Again, everyone's different. Your, off, your specific office may have a, a way that they like it saved. This is just how I like it. All right, so the next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna import the values that we've already put into your app file. So right here, this yellow button where it says import values. If you click on that and you go from import from info field, this is where we're going to import Jack and Jill's name and email address. Okay, so right here, this shows me which fields I have values in. So under buyer information, I have four values. Under file information, I have three values. That's going to be my name and my office and stuff. So I'm not going to select that because I know I already have my form values filled in from my um, work that I've done prior. So I'm going to click choose. This is going to show me exactly what I'm putting in here. If I have a typo, I can correct it here. Like say I needed a period in Jack's email address. I can add it right here. We do the same for Jill's. Okay, I'm going to click start import and it has been imported. So I'm going to say done. So how I can go and check and see if this has been done is I can go to that signature page where this information would be housed. And right here under buyer's information, I see Jack's name and his email address and then Jack's email address and name also. Okay, so the next thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to import the values from the FMLS. This is going to save me a ton of time when I'm filling out this contract. So I'm gonna go back to the import values and I'm gonna click on import from FMLS. And here I'm gonna put in my FMLS number, which was 686-4539. I'm gonna say search, it's pulled up my address, and I'm gonna say choose. 
All right, so down here, I can select what I want to be imported and not imported. So it's gonna automatically check all fields. Since I know that I'm going to attach my legal exhibit, I'm going to uncheck all of these, okay? But see, this already gives the listing broker firm name. I've got Hicks's name. I have his MLS office ID. These are all things I'm not gonna have to print out and type in and risk human error. So I'm gonna acknowledge that I agree to these terms and start import. And then this is again going to show me a summary of what was imported, 17 values and done. All right, so if I wanna check some of these things, I can see that the address has been filled out here. Down here, I've already got Harry Norman Realtors as the seller's broker because Hicks is a Harry Norman Realtor. And then if I go to the signature page, this is where a lot of the information that's gonna be a time saver will be filled out. I've got all of the selling broker's licensee information here. So again, all ways to save you time. And check the chat. Oh, Essie says this is gonna save so much time, OMG. Yes, it will. And I also remember when I wrote my first couple of contracts, I thought that it was going to take me 10 hours every time I wrote a contract. <laughs> it doesn't, it's going to get faster. And all these are little time savers for you. And I think that most of all, it's going to decrease human error. Um, so the more error you can decrease, the better. So now it is time for us to fill out our agreement. I think it would be great if you had your little key terms checklist that you've discussed with your client. If you have that printed out and it's sitting beside you, makes this super easy to fill out. So we're just gonna kind of start from the beginning. We're gonna put our offer date is going to be today's date, which is May 24th, 2021. And the good thing about having all of your documents and your forms merged together in this one PD or this one form is the ones that are from app files. So in this case, it would be your purchase and sale and your um, financing contingency. Anything that I fill out on one is going to carry over to the other. So when we get to the financing contingency, you're going to notice that the date is already going to be filled out on that one because I put it here. All right. So you We've already uploaded our address, the MLS number, and the tax parcel ID. We are going to attach a, the legal exhibit here too, because that's best practice. Another best practice is we don't want to leave any blanks. So you can do NA in all the blanks. Some people do dashes like this. I think that NA is probably a little bit better. To do. All right, so now we get to the purchase price of the property. We know from our key terms checklist that we are offering $775. The closing costs that we are asking the seller to contribute to our buyer at closing, we're asking for $5,000. Closing date, we're asking for a June 30th, 2021 closing date. Again, when you are talking with your clients on your key terms checklist, make sure you look at a calendar. Don't just assume that 30 days from today or you know, whatever date you're using is going to fall on a weekday or that it's not going to fall on a national holiday or make sure that your client's not going to be at the beach that week, okay? Check the date with your client, okay? We are asking for possession at closing. If you were um, going to give the seller some temporary occupancy, which is something that's happening a lot right now in this market, you would check this box and you would put how many days after closing they're going to give you possession at what time, and then you would attach the temporary occupancy agreement. But we are not doing that, so we're going to put NA here and check the chat. Is the closing date dict dictated by the lender? So yes and no. Um, for a That's one discussion you're gonna want to have with the lender because they're going to at least need long enough to get the underwriting done. 
I would say 30 days is a pretty standard closing date. If for some reason you need to go shorter than 30 days, that's definitely a discussion you're going to want to have with the lender. And you're also going to want to have that discussion with your buyer because they're going to have to get all the information to the lender in a very timely manner if you're doing shorter than 30 days. Um, with Prosperity, they offer some accelerated programs where you can get your buyer completely underwritten before you make the offer. So that um, would be an advantage to where you could do a shorter closing, but you also need to check with the closing attorney, even if you're doing a cash offer, because they need enough time to run title and pull all the necessary documents also. Um, is the temporary occupancy agreement required for less than seven days? Yes, you want the temporary occupancy agreement for anything that they're getting after closing because that is going to take the liability off of your client, the buyer, and put the liability on the seller. Um, if you read that temporary occupancy agreement, that's going to state exactly who's responsible for what. And then there's also a place where you can put a dollar amount to where if they do not vacate at the proper time, how much money they're going to owe your seller per day or your buyer per day. Um, Jacqueline, is it ever okay to put a percentage of cost instead of a dollar amount for the seller's contribution? No, you have to put a dollar amount here. Um, but that does bring up a point that for certain, every type of loan, there's a certain percentage of the loan that the seller can contribute to the buyer's closing costs. So that's something you're gonna to wanna to check with your lender as well. All right, so holder of earnest money. That's going to be Harry Norman. Closing attorney law firm, we are gonna close with Campbell and Brannon. And I'm gonna even go ahead and specify that we wanna close in East Cobb, okay? You can do that later after you go under contract, but I always kind of like to say where I wanna close in here. So earnest money, they are going to deposit this through Harry Norman's online direct deposit for the earnest money. If you don't know that we have that, it's really easy for you and for your buyers to do. It's just, they go on our website and there's a drop down menu where they can click direct deposit earnest money. If they are doing that, that is an ACH. Okay, that's not a wire transfer, it's not cash, it's not check, that is an ACH, okay? You want to make sure that, you're, that you click on which box you're going to use. We're not gonna do this as of the offer date, so I'm gonna put NA. We're going to do it within three days of binding agreement date. So I'm gonna check B, and I'm gonna put my $10,000 in here, and I'm gonna put that they're going to deposit that within three days of binding agreement. And then I'm going to put NA down here. Make sure you check which box. Technically, if this is not checked, then whatever they're putting here doesn't matter. Okay. You want to make sure that you check which box. So inspection and due diligence, we're going to offer seven days. We are not offering additional option money. So I'm going to put NA here. And the property was not built prior to 1978. So for lead-based paint, I am checking it was not. Okay, so this is a little pop quiz. If Harry Norman is representing both the buyer and the seller, what do I check? I don't have a prize, but I'll give you a virtual round of applause if someone can answer me. Anybody? Yay, Sherry, designated agent. So Harry Norman Realtors is representing the buyer. That would be me. And then Harry Norman Realtors is also representing the seller. That would be Hicks, loan sent. And then material relationship disclosure. There is no material relationship. If Jack was my brother, I would put that here. Um, if I knew that Hicks was representing his brother, we would put that there. That would be something like that. So time limit of offer. In this market, sellers don't really pay attention to this, but um, you want to ask the listing agent when you're making an offer right now. I would ask when you're accepting offers until because you want to at least give your offer time to be um, considered. 
Um, you can always amend this in a counter offer or by signing if they need to change this. Um, generally speaking, I would say 24 hours is a good time period. You also wanna think about the time that you're sending this offer over. Sometimes you send it over at 10 o'clock at night and the listing agent may receive it, but they're not going to necessarily present it to their sellers at 10 o'clock. So let's say 24 hours in this case, we're going to send it over at noon. Okay. It's almost 11, but by the time I get done filling this out, I review it with my clients and they sign, it'll probably be 12 o'clock. So let's give them till 12 o'clock PM on May 25th to respond. All right, so we're gonna scroll through all of the fine print because we all know exactly what that says, right? You guys can spout it off to me. Okay, so now under eight, this is where we are going to put our exhibits and addenda. One other pop quiz for you. Are exhibits lettered or numbered? Does anybody know? Yay, oh, look at my new agents from Agent Accelerate answering. They know it's lettered. Okay, so what do we have for this one? We do not have a community association disclosure. We do have a conventional loan contingency exhibit. So that's going to be A, because we put that one first. We don't have a lead-based paint. We don't have a lease or purchase. We do have a legal description. And we do have a seller's property disclosure statement exhibit. I put the seller's property disclosure statement exhibit after the conventional loan, so I'm gonna make that B. And then the legal description, I will make C, okay? So if you keep scrolling down, now we are in our special stipulation. So we said on our key terms checklist that we were gonna ask the seller to pay for a home warranty and also a termite letter. So you may have special stipulations that you have saved on a Word document on your computer that you like to use all the time. That's something that I suggest. If you have standard ones that you always like to use, you can go ahead and save those so you can copy and paste. Um, if you have something tricky, not a standard one, one that we don't have a GAR special stipulation for and one that is not straightforward, such as you're asking the sellers to professionally clean the house, always cons consult Campbell and Brandon or your broker. We are not attorneys. We don't want to pretend like we are. Um, always better to err on the side of caution and ask for help. So, but in this case, we do have standard stipulations that we're gonna use. So if you click on this blue box, it pulls up this special stipulation box right here, okay? So under C at the top, it says saved clauses. If I click show, these are all types of stipulations that are saved in here that we do not have to rewrite. So you can search for it. So I'm gonna first search for warranty and I've got one right here. So I'm gonna click on that. If I can get my mouse to work and I scroll down, I want, I put where I want it. Do I want it at the beginning or at the end? Well, I don't have anything here yet. So the beginning is fine. And see, it just goes ahead and inserts it there. And then I also want to search for the termite letter because they don't currently have a termite bond. So we want to make sure there are no termites in this house before we buy it. So I'm going to click on this one down here where it says seller to provide new report to buyer. So I'm going to click on that. And then I'm going to insert that one at the end and it's already in here. And then I can fill out these amounts right here and the dates. So I always like to number my special stipulations. That way, if you are in a counter offer situation, and say the seller says, okay, well, we're going to accept your offer, but we are not giving you a home warranty. In the counter offer, they could just say all parties agree to remove special stipulation number one. They don't have to retype everything. So if you number them one and two, that makes that easier when you're referencing them. Um, so here at or before closing, this is where you would put an amount. So you may want to check with 210 or American Home Shield, whoever you like to work with, you would put an amount there. 
and then you would put a date where they're going to provide you with that um, Georgia wood infestation report. I would make that date within due diligence. So count your days out and then we're gonna click save changes. So they're right here. This is not a huge space for special stipulations. You may need more space. So you would check additional special stipulations are attached and you would search the form in your paperwork that says special stipulations and it's a whole page where you can fill out more. Okay, so moving along, here's our signature pages. You could add their address, but you just need one form of them re receiving notice on here. So I'm gonna do email. My information's already filled out. Hicks's is already filled out. Then you have the binding agreement date. That's what's going to be completed by the last person receiving notice of acceptance when we go under contract. So additional page number one, this is something that's included in all of our contracts. This is the COVID steps. Um, you don't have to have both. You could delete one, just choose whichever one's better for your situation. And then they'll sign it. This is our affiliated business arrangement disclosure. They're going to acknowledge that they've received that. Here is our wire fraud. Okay. Now we are at the conventional loan contingency exhibit. So like I said earlier, see how this is already nice and filled out at the top from where we did it in the purchase and sale agreement. So I'm going to put, this was exhibit A. All right, so now here under application, I'm going to check A. Check A. Like I said earlier, you've got to check which one. If it's not checked, filling this out is technically not enforceable. So we know, I don't think I put this on our exhibit on our example, but they are putting 20% down. So this, they're going to have a loan amount that's 80% of the purchase price. We know it was a 30 year loan. Then they had a 2.75 interest rate that was fixed and institutional. So under B, I'm just gonna fill out in A because they are not getting a second mortgage loan. Under use of particular mortgage lender, I'm representing the buyers, so I do not really want to put that they're approved by Prosperity because, as you know, that means that only Prosperity could give them a loan denial letter and get them out of the contract. So when you're representing the buyer, best practices, you don't really want to put anything in here. It protects your buyer more to not put a lender in this space. All right, so going down for financing contingency. So we're going to put 18 days under the financing contingency. And if you scroll down to the last blank under 11, we're going to put 18 days for the appraisal contingency. And if you keep scrolling down, you've got the signature page down here. As you see, Jack and Jill's information is here. Harry Norman Realtors information is here on Hicks's because I imported that. What you don't see is my information here. That is because I did not fill out this form value in my form. So this would be another good one when you're completing your form value to go ahead and put this here. So buyer brokerage form would be Harry Norman, Realtors. My name is Victoria Hughes. That's what's on my license. And my I'm a member of Atlanta. Realtors Association, I can't type. Okay, I think I have a couple questions. Why is it necessary to provide this form? So we want to provide this financing contingency exhibit to make this purchase contingent upon my buyer getting their loan. This protects their earnest money in the event that they are denied the loan that they can get it back as long as they terminate within the 18 days of that financing contingency agreement. Also, we want the appraisal contingency in here because that protects them in the event the home does not appraise. Within those 18 days, they can terminate and get their earnest money back. Um, a good listing agent is going to want, to, even if you are 
not making this purchase contingent on a loan, which we are seeing that a lot right now. A good listing agent, so take note for when you're a listing agent, is going to want to see this form regardless if there are zeros down here in these blanks, okay? That is because this is going to give me as a listing agent the ability to talk to your lender, okay? There's a clause in here and I can't find it right now. Okay, here it is. Under nine, buyer does hereby authorize the seller and the brokers identified herein to communicate with the lenders with whom buyer is working with, okay? So if I did not include this, say we were doing zero days financing and zero days appraisal, and I didn't send this with my offer. Well, Hicks is gonna want to know, how are you buying this house, first of all, okay? Are you getting a loan? Is it cash? I want to see some sort of an exhibit. He's probably, he's a good agent. He's going to counter back and ask for this. And he's all, a good listing agent is also going to want to counter back because they're going to want to have the ability in writing to talk to my buyer's lender about this offer. Okay, so Essie's asking, why did you say it protects the buyer to not provide the lender? So if you read the fine print on here, this says, unless an approved mortgage lender is identified below, buyer may apply for the approval of the loans with any institutional mortgage lender licensed to do business in Georgia. If an approved mortgage lender is identified below, buyer shall apply for approval of the loans with at least such approved mortgage lender. Nothing herein shall require the buyer to obtain mortgage financing from approved mortgage lender. So, if your buyer gets approved and they don't have any issues, then that's fine if you put an approved mortgage lender here. However, when you scroll down to number six, use of approved mortgage lender and loan denial letter. I don't wanna read all this verbatim because it's gonna get... Okay, the last line of the first paragraph says, a loan denial letter from a non-institutional mortgage lender shall not be the basis for buyer to terminate this agreement. Okay, so that's talking about if they if it's a non-institutional. I want to find. Okay, it's right here. If the buyer has agreed to apply for the loans with an approved mortgage lender, so that would be the ones that I would put in that blank. It says the loan denial letter must be from an approved mortgage lender. Okay, so in this example, Jack and Jill are, are pre-approved with Prosperity. So if I put Prosperity in this blank, but they got denied, but they decided, okay, we're going to actually try to work with Quicken and Quicken denied them on the basis of what we put in here. I could not provide Hicks, the listing agent, with a loan denial letter from Quicken and get out of this contract. Okay, if I put Quicken in here with Prosperity and it was from Quicken, then yes, I could provide that. But it's better to protect them by not putting any lenders in here. So therefore, if they do not get financing, they can provide it from any lender. So I hope that clears it up. I, I feel like this um, conventional loan contingency exhibit is, can be very, very confusing. There's a lot of fine print. There's a lot of dates in here. Um, and time periods, if something does not, if they don't get pre-approved or if there um, is an issue with the appraisal. So you just wanna make sure you read all these dates, you count them out if you have any issues. All right, so moving right along to the seller's property disclosure statement exhibit. So there were a couple of people that had questions about how you edit these forms, okay? So that's what we're gonna go over now. So this is one that we uploaded from an outside source. This was not in our app file. So what you're going to do is you're gonna click edit right here on the top right-hand side. And it opens up this screen right here. Oh goodness, hold on. So it's gonna open up this screen on the left, okay? So the first thing I wanna do is put my exhibit letter, which was B. So I'm gonna click text. And that gives me this little plus sign where I place what I want to enter. So I'm gonna click, I'm gonna do B and create. That puts my B here. 
So now I need to do my offer date. So I'm gonna click text again and put my offer date of May 24th. And there it is. So if I wanna move it because I'm a little um, type A and I don't like that it's blurring into right there, I just click on it. And when it turns orange, I can move it. I can move it here if I wanted to. So I can move it to where it looks perfect how I want it. So now I need to do the address. So I'm gonna click text and it's 558 Boulder Crest. And I don't remember the rest of it, but you guys are going to pretend like I do. And I filled out all of that. Okay, so then it was Marietta. Georgia, and then I can't remember the zip code, but you get the idea from there. All right, so when I'm done with editing here, I'm just gonna go to the top of my screen and click close to close out. So I'm gonna scroll down to the signature page because we know that all exhibits have to have either an initial or a signature. And we're also going to assume that I've already reviewed this seller's property disclosure statement with Jack and Jill Smith whenever we were coming up with our key terms. And that's why we decided we were going to ask for a home warranty and the termite letter. All right. So the sellers have already signed, but now I need to put a signature request in here for Jack and Jill. So I'm going to click edit again. And I'm going to click text to put in Jack's name, Jack Smith, create. Then I'm gonna do text again for Jill Smith. All right, so now to do their signatures, right here on the left-hand side where it says add signatures, I'm just going to select, I want the buyer signature and I want to display the date. So I'm gonna check the check mark and place signature. So that gives me my plus sign again. So I'm gonna put it right here. There's where his signature is going to go. I like to move my date down to the date line. So I'm just going to click on just the date. And when it turns it orange, that means I can move it. So I'm moving it down here. So now I wanna put Jill, she's buyer number two. So I'm gonna click buyer signature two and then place signature and do the same thing for Jill. If I can figure out how to move my mouse. I'm telling you guys, this has been a big adjustment for me. I've used a Mac for a long time. All right, so I've got this looking the way I want it. I'm gonna click close. And this way I can send all of my signature requests in at one time. I'm not gonna have to send them several different signature requests at once because I've got this all in the same document. Let me check the chat. For as is properties, i.e. no disclosure, what are a few other good special steps to add in, please? So are you referring to one where they didn't provide a seller's property disclosure? Like they may be a landlord or they just didn't ever live in the home? In that case, there is a form where they can fill out latent defects. It's, it's, it was a new form this year, a GAR form. You could ask them to complete that. Um, I would definitely do an inspection. Even if you are going to buy it as is, say that was part of your negotiation, I would still have a due diligence period and do an inspection. Even if you're not doing a due diligence period, which I do not recommend at all, do an inspection. You always want to know what you're buying and you want to protect your, your buyers. All right, so now I'm here on my legal description. Description. This would come from Campbell and Brandon. It would basically be the deed. It would tell me exactly where it is because we want to know that we are buying the property that we are um, intending to buy. So we're gonna click edit again. And we're gonna do text because I need to put my legal description exhibit letter. So this was exhibit C. So you're gonna do the same thing that you did for the other ones. 
You do exhibit C up here, and then you want to add initials. So you can do add initials, buyer initial, display date, and place initials down here. And then you can do buyer two for Jill Smith, and then place initials down here at the bottom. And I like the way that this looks, so I'm gonna click close. All right, so the next thing that I would do is I would get my key terms checklist out and I would review my contract, make sure that, yes, I did put 775 and I didn't transpose the numbers and do 757. And I did, you know, do the correct earnest money. I checked all the right boxes. Um, everything is as it should be. Always review your contract, okay? So the next thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to review this with Jack and Jill, okay? You're gonna know your clients. You're going to know what they prefer. Some clients are gonna want you to walk through every step of the process with them. Some of them are, you've written hopefully not 10 offers, but we know some things are like that are happening in this market. So they may know this contract inside and out by now. And all they want you to do is just send it over for signatures. I believe a best practice is still to send over an email summary or a text summary or something of those key terms. So let me go back to the PowerPoint and pull this up. All right, so like I said, review for any blanks, errors, typos, et cetera sign, initial the purchase and sale, and then send the signature request to buyers. That's what you would do next. And then we're gonna submit the offer. So we're gonna go through all these steps next in our power, in our app files. So in that um, how to write a purchase and sale guide that I'm going to send you, there is a template for sending your key terms to your client to review that you can copy and paste into an email that I would suggest doing. Just, it checks your work and it shows them that you're a professional. So I've got to sign this before I send it to Jack and Jill to sign, right? So like I said, there's several different ways to do everything in app files. One way to sign would be just to cl click on what you're trying to sign. I'm not the buyer, but this is just an example. I could click on this. And it brings up here the signing field, okay? I, I'm not the buyer, I don't wanna do that. How I like to sign it so I don't have to click through every single signature is I click on these buttons up here. So sign now, I am the selling agent I'm representing the buyer. So I'm gonna click on the selling agent signature for the purchase and sale, whoops. The selling agent signature for the conventional loan contingency agreement. And then I'm not initialing the seller's property disclosure, so I don't need to check that. So I'm gonna check next. You type your name, you choose which font you like. For some reason, I always choose this one. I don't know why. <laughs> and then click next. And then you're accepting your signature and accept. So you can go through here and check that my signature is on here under the selling broker, okay? So I'm also, I think there's something I have to initial. Yes, selling broker initial on the purchase and sale. So selling agent, click next. I put my initials, check my font that I like, acknowledge and accept. All right, so now I'm going to send this to Jack and Jill to sign. I've already called them and said, I've completed the offer. I'm sending over your key terms to review. Now I'm going to send this to you to sign. Let me check the chat really quick. Why do you sign first? I always sign first just so that's already done. And that way, once they sign, I can go ahead and shoot it over to the listing agent. I'm not having to do anything else. Um, I think that, I guess that's just personal preference, Sherry. I don't know, do you do it differently? Yeah, you do? See, it's it, I like seeing how everyone does it different. Um, and some people may like to sign last just in case there's any changes. Is that why you like to do it that way, Sherry? 
No, just how you do it. All right, so uh, when I'm, I'm asking that because one time I had a client take something without my signature on it to an attorney, which is a weird circumstances. And they called me about the closing and I said, what closing? I didn't sign it. That's why, just curious. Mm. Well, good point. All right, so now I'm going to send this to Jack and Jill to sign, okay? So I'm going to go here where it says electronic signatures and click request signatures. You can also do that up here under actions and do sig, where is it? I can't even find it now. That's signature verification report. Oh, I thought it was underneath here. Maybe it's not. All right, so I'm gonna click on request signature. Start a signature request. So I'm going to type in Jack's name, Jack Smith here, and he is the buyer. So once I click it, it's going to click on all the signature fields that he has to sign because I've got one document I'm sending. And then for initials, he's the buyer here also. I'm going to click next. I'm not going to give him the option to edit these time limits. So I'm not clicking on that, clicking next. So here is the email that Jack is going to receive, okay? I've got my email signature in here. The wire fraud warning is in here. I can edit this email if I want to. So if I want to put my key terms checklist in here, I can key terms of agreement. I can put this in here. You can do whatever you want, okay? Now, since I've already put Jack and Jill's email address in my buyer info, these are gonna be saved in here. I don't have to do it again. So I'm gonna click on jacksmith at gmail.com. I'm not actually going to send this to him because I am sure there is a jacksmith at gmail.com that exists and I don't want him to think he's buying a house today and call me and say, what is going on? So we'll just pretend that I sent this to him. And then I'm gonna do the same for Jill, okay? And then once they sign it, I'm going to send this to the listing agent along with their pre-approval letter. And if there's anything else I need to send, I'm going to do that as well. Okay. One thing that I'm going to suggest is that you call the listing agent, pick up the phone, tell he or she that you are sending over an offer for Jack and Jill Smith. You are super excited to present this offer. They love the home. They're fully underwritten. I mean, whatever details you can give to sell your clients in this market shows that you're a professional. The listing agent is going to be excited to work with me because I am already telling him that I have the um, inspection scheduled. Um, I've, I'm giving him details. I'm showing my professionalism. So always pick up and call the agent. At the very least, send them a text and tell them the offer is coming, okay? So when I'm going to send Hicks this offer, I'm going to click back on my purchase and sale agreement that's been signed by everyone at this point, me, Jack, and Jill, and I'm going to click on send via email as a PDF. Okay, so I'm going to type in his email address here. If I need to copy anybody on this, like say I'm going to copy my mentor on here, I can add a BCC or a CC field. Now, I've already attached my purchase and sale agreement. I'm also going to attach their pre-approval letter because I want to show that they are pre-approved with prosperity. They have got great financing behind them. So I'm going to click on their pre-approval letter to attach that also. Click finish. So now you can see that both of those are on here as attachments. I'm going to type in 558 Boulder Crest offer. And then I'm going to type an email to Hicks. I'm going to tell him I'm super excited to work with him on this contract. Can't wait to get our buyer, you know, my buyer to the closing table that I've attached their offer and their pre-approval letter. Please feel free to reach out to Stephanie McAllister with Prosperity with any questions, or I may be already having Stephanie set up to call and sell Jack and Jill to Hicks. I think that's a really good idea in this market as well. And then always ask them to confirm receipt. The last thing you want is to work on this offer, have Jack and Jill excited about making the offer, and then it get lost in Hicks's email and he never sees it. So 
send him a text, call him, and also ask for him to confirm receipt. My signature block's already in here, and I'm going to click send message, and this is going to go out to Hicks. So we have written our offer. Yay. Super excited. Okay. So you've submitted your offer. You want to make sure the listing agent confirms receipt of the offer in email. And now you wait and hopefully it's accepted. So some pro tips for writing an offer. Use that key terms checklist that we discussed with your client as a guide. Use that when you are coming up with your offer. Use that when you are reviewing your offer to make sure that you filled out everything correctly. Don't just use your, don't just use your head. I'm a big, big proponent of writing things down and double checking. Um, before sending signature requests to your buyers, call them to walk through the contract, highlighting the key terms discussed. Confirm the key terms by sending an email to the buyer that we talked about. Don't leave any blanks. Special stipulations, don't pretend to be an attorney. Use the pre-written stipulations and app files or consult Campbell and Brannon, your broker, your mentor. Um, anyone, if you have questions, exhibits are lettered, amendments are numbered. And then the legal description is best practice is to attach a copy. And you can get that from Campbell and Brannon by emailing attorneys at Campbell and 